Okay, we are going to switch gears now and introduce our next speaker, who is Mark Drury. We were very fortunate this uh, summer to have been able to tap into our amazing faculty at Georgetown. And um, some of them are on their way to other appointments right now. And uh, Professor Drury is one of them. Professor Neve is another one. And we have several here. And of course, uh, Imad Shaheen was, was here until he, uh, until he moved to, um, uh, to a different university overseas in the Gulf, in uh, uh, the Hamid bin Khalifa University. So um, Mark Drury, his um, assistant, visiting assistant professor at Colgate University in, in Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. And he's going to talk about race and slavery in the Sahara in the 19th century. Uh, continuities and shifts. And this will probably take us also back to yesterday's pre uh, presentation by um, by Professor Ziai in the SOAS London. So take it, take it away. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Susan. Um, can everyone hear me and see, and see, the, um, see the presentation? Yes, you yes. do. Great. <laughs> Well, I'm so pleased to be joining uh, the Summer Teacher Institute, and thank you, especially Susan, for the invitation. Um, I wish I could be joining you in person. I had such a generative and productive year as a postdoctoral fellow with the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown. Um, I always enjoyed my time there and uh, would have liked to have been back, but I'm, I'm glad I can join you remotely at least today. Um, I am an anthropologist actually by training uh, and my research has been conducted primarily in and around the disputed territory of Western Sahara. It's where my focus has been on unresolved legacies of decolonization, nationalist political conflict, and uh, forms of belonging and the relationship of the past and the present in contemporary political formations in Northwest Africa. I've conducted research in the disputed territory as well as in Mauritania and in the Sahrawi refugee camps in Algeria and in Morocco, uh, what I call Morocco proper. <laughs> um, but what I'll be focusing on today are um, is this histories in the Sahara with particular uh, focus on the trans-Saharan trade and the kinds of social formations produced by this trade over centuries uh, with particular focus on the 19th century and with a little bit uh, looking at sort of shifts and what I call legacies, uh, ongoing legacies today. So I begin there um, with uh, the uh, fairly banal observation that trade has long been integral to Saharan social formations. This is for a region defined by high variability of rainfall, limited access to water, conditions which constrain agricultural activity Life in the Sahara has long been made possible through connections to resources from elsewhere. This makes sort of theorizing social formations and a sense of place in the Sahara both challenging and conceptually generative. The anthropologist Jude, Judith Scheel, writing of Al Khalil, a board located near the border on the border between southern Algeria and northern Mali, this kind of truck stop town, according to Scheel, quote, makes no sense on its own but needs to be understood with reference to the various networks, outside connections and power relations that make it what it is. Shield develops uh, this concept of connectivity, which captures both the sense of autonomy associated with Saharan ways of life, as well as the very visible dependency, which makes these forms of life possible. Connectivity and regional connectivity in particular provides a way for thinking about the conditions of possibility that enable the varied ways of life across the Sahara from oasis date palm cultivation to nomadic and semi-nomadic pastoralism to modern day truck stops such as Al Khalil where uh, which traffic in petrol, livestock, cigarettes, as well as sometimes migrants. Shield's analytical attention to connectivity therefore addresses an issue uh, that has been a major scholarly topic of the region, trans-Saharan trade. Studies of trans-Saharan trade provide a historical basis for conceptualizing the Sahara as a space of connectivity, um, one that traces can be traced through vast sets of commercial, legal, and political networks connecting the Mediterranean and sub-Saharan Africa from the ninth century, possibly even earlier, to the 19th. 
In doing so, studies of trans-Saharan trade historically served to debunk the notion of an internally divided Africa isolated from the world. Not unlike the trade itself, however, which long beguiled African traders seeking mythical sources of gold, uh, scholarship on trans-Saharan trade emerged often from outside the region. And by this, I don't do not only mean Western scholarship, but that for a long time, academic interest in the Sahara was derivative of a long, larger debate among economic historians who were primarily focused on the effects, transformative effects, devastating effects of slavery on um, West Africa. As a result, scholarship of, of trans-Saharan trade specifically was primarily concerned with how this region fit within and was affected by broader global, global economic systems and developments. Nonetheless, historians writing in this vein, a broad view of trans-Saharan trade, provide an important overview for the scope and longevity of this social network and the significant role that it played in what's sometimes called the medieval world economy. Ralph Austin notes that while exact quantities remain elusive, historians estimate that a little more than one ton per year of gold traveled across the Sahara between 800 and 1500 CE, the common or current era. Current era. And here uh, is a map or an image, a detail uh, and a map of Mansa Musa, the 14th century king of Mali, who um, became a, the kind of the personification, the embodiment of this, uh, this fascination uh, with gold from West, A West Africa, and who's said to have carried and distributed enough gold uh, while completing Hajj in 1324 to have single-handedly affected prices in Cairo as he passed through on his way to Mecca. Here he's depicted in a map from a 14th century Catalan atlas. And another detail um, depicts and focuses on um, the, those people who live in tents and ride camels and cover themselves, i.e. the peoples of the Sahara. And interestingly, facing Mansa Musa, this kind of interface is one that's at the center of my talk between the Sahara and what's often referred to as the Sahel, the shore, southern shore of the desert. So the trade in gold supplied Mediterranean economies for, with coinage transported from West African locales, often with sources concentrated west of the Niger, Niger River Bend. This source was particularly important for emergent mercantile economies on the northern shore of the Mediterranean that depended upon gold to maintain currency reserves. These currency reserves would eventually be supplied with the importation of silver from the New World, but until then, gold was paramount, and of course, European colonization was not yet, yet capable of accessing or controlling these riches. Trans-Saharan trade brokered this often inaccessible source, which uh, captured the imagination of traders and the European population alike. Here is a 16th century uh, reproduction of a painting entitled Girl Weigh Weighing Gold by a French painter that's reproduced in Fernand Braudel's Wheels of Civilization. While gold and enslaved people captured the attention of scholars initially drawn to the broad outlines and major sort of causes of trans-Saharan trade, these long distance networks were only made feasible through regional intra-Saharan social processes of the movement and exchange of people and goods. And involved with these uh, more uh, local but, and still long distance uh, exchanges, uh, involved a wide variety of goods, um, including goat skins, ivory, spices, gum arabic, and even ostrich feathers in the 19th century. And while these ostrich feathers in the gold coin were transported largely to meet the demand, sometimes fluctuating, of Mediterranean uh, mer mercantile economies, the more banal exchange of foodstuff, livestock, um, and specifically camels, were crucial to the intra-regional economies within the Sahara. And uh, these exchanges brought uh, a great deal of, um, produced a great deal of interaction among peoples of the Sahara, North Africa, and again, the Sahel. So here I'll pause a moment for a, a map uh, with the dotted lines delineating sort of the edges of the Sahara in climatic terms, but also the place names here um, include several that I'll be referring to throughout the talk. Uh, at times, I'll be focusing on the kind of Atlantic coast of the Sahara, the Western Sahara, um, also uh, Mauritania, which is a borrowed uh, Roman term, of course, for a land that was for a long time known as Bilad al which is 
a name, place name on the map. Um, at the same time, Marrakesh and Algiers, uh, now in Morocco and Algeria, of course, will will come up in the in the talk as well as Wargla, which was a kind of terminus at the northern end of the Sahara in Algeria. Um, likewise, I'll be mentioning throughout the talk the Niger River, the Niger Bend on this map, as well as the Senegal River. And these are spaces of, of significant interface uh, between um, peoples of the Sahara and what is often referred to as the Sahel. Um, these are meeting points between sedentary and nomadic peoples, between Arabic speakers and non-Arabophone ethnic groups, such as the Soninke, uh, Pular, Wolof, and others. And although Islam provided a shared point, point of orientation beginning as early as the 19, 11th century, the Niger River and Senegal River remained thresholds and still do today, generative of forms of difference, including racial difference, where the Sahara meets the Sahel and where the Arabophone world meets what's often referred to as Bilad al Sudan, of course, land of the blacks. And I'll use the words Bilad al Sudan and Sahel, as well as Niger Ben, Senegal River, somewhat interchangeably. So the broad scope that initially framed historians' interest in trans-Saharan trade allowed the, them to note the regional system's remarkable, extraordinary longevity. Given the arduous, slow travel through an unforgiving climate and across a fragmented political landscape, the duration of caravan commerce for over a millennium was truly a remarkable, extraordinary yeah. historical phenomenon. Ibn Khaldun, the uh, 14th century uh, North African scholar, political advisor, philosopher, uh, noted or marveled at the distance and hardship of the road that caravanners travel. They have to cross a difficult desert made almost inaccessible by fear of danger, potential for being raided, and beset, of course, by the danger of thirst. Water is found there only in a few well-known spots to, will, to which caravan guides lead the way. So before moving on to the 19th century itself, I'd like to focus on some of the organizational forms that enabled this arduous trade system to perdure over so many centuries. And one does not have to look outside the Sahara, but rather at the mode of transportation, as well as what one scholar has termed the quote, legal culture underpinning the transactions, which enabled this trade to take place over long distances, entailing relations of credit and debt that could take months or even years to resolve. And by form of organization, I mean specifically the caravan, uh, in Arabic, khafila, organ which organized large groups of peoples and camels to undertake difficult and these difficult and dangerous itineraries across long distances. At their grandest and greatest, these caravans were made up of reportedly 1,000 to even 5,000 camels and hundreds of people. The largest caravans were made to actually traverse the Sahara, transporting goods from um, gateways such as Warla or um, Gurmim in southern Morocco uh, through Saharan oases, reaching their southern terminus at places such as Timbuktu or in the banks of the Senegal and Niger rivers. And they were so large precisely because uh, it was uh, their strength was in lie, lay in their numbers. And of course, the most numerous member of the caravan was the camel. So utterly essential because of its extraordinary capacity to regulate temperature variation, moderate its perspiration, and therefore limit its water intake needs. The veneration and intimate understanding of camels among pastoralist societies truly cannot be underestimated. It is boundless, rich, and deep. But for now, suffice it to say that the camel was so ideally suited to transport across the sands of the Sahara, a camel load was a well-established measure, weight measure for transportation, that it substituted and replaced wheeled transport across parts of North Africa during the medieval period. Islaine Leiden, um, from whose book this map is reproduced, notes that caravans operating in the Western Sahara were of two types the massive long distance caravans that I was describing known as akabar from the uh, Arabic term for, for large and, and greatness, but which were actually convoys of multiple caravans traveling together. These would travel annually, only during colder months. Um, and ultimately they disappeared once uh, firearms came on the scene in the 19th century and provided a new form of protection. The smaller caravans, however, were um, perhaps much more common, known as rafba or rafai from accompaniment, 
which would travel shorter distances and typically tra traveling in a southern direction from Saharan oases, uh, carrying dates, salt from salt mines and heading south to trade for food such as millet um, or sometimes European merchandise such as cloth, writing paper and enslaved people from the uh, Sahel. With these smaller caravans in particular, the, they moved, uh, as Leiden notes, not in the slow image, uh, image of a slow moving train, but relatively quickly at speeds ranging from four to five kilometers and as much as possible at night. So if the caravan was one sort of foundational form that sustained trans saharan trade for a millennium, another was Islamic law. And Leiden in her study of 19th century trade in the Western Sahara, primarily uh, started in Timbuktu and moved through what is now Mauritania to Morocco, Leiden emphasized the importance of what she terms a legal culture that by the 11th century extended across much of North and West Africa. Islam provided a shared basis for moral and legal authority and meant that those engaged in trade, long distance trade, were also oriented around the same textual sources, the Quran, Hadith, Sunnah, and texts of legal jurisprudence or fiqh that eventually converged in North and West Africa around the Maliki school. As such, uh, contracts, even among those who were not Arabic speakers, could be written in Arabic. And here, sorry, is a, is a map of, this, of the Western Sahara region and showing sort of the density of networks, particularly from the Southern oases um, to the Senegal River in this example. A significant aspect of this legal culture described by Leiden is of course the role of qadis or judges as well as muftis, legal scholars who produce uh, um, opinions when consulted, which although non-binding reflect an, their authoritative understanding of fiqh or Islamic law. One scholar estimated uh, upwards of 285 muftis who were active in 19th century Mauritania. This can be thought of as kind of 285 different centers of moral and, and legal authority distributed throughout, none of which were, were centralized, perhaps referring obliquely to the, to the previous talk under any single central authority. Um, likewise, Qadis in Mauritania, unlike uh, any, certainly any judge in, in the US or even those under Ottoman rule, were not accountable to any higher political authority and were instead appointed by local imams. Uh, Leiden's insight is to show how these Qadis and Muftis uh, served as what she termed legal service providers, even uh, uh, kinds of financial intermediaries, who, in addition to resolving disputes, functioned as kinds of estate guardians, debt collectors, and even custodians of property for um, uh, transactions involving a, a property owner and an agent who, who does the traveling. They um, defined terms of trade, uh, clarified standards and equivalencies, which is important in a region with multiple currencies, and negotiated between different behavioral norms. Here, uh, it sounds like euphemism for dispute resolution. As Leiden writes, their roles were paramount in the context of 19th century Western Sahara where no single state or overarching power ruled supreme. And in her study, Leiden notes that there are often women who are engaged in the legal contracts uh, that, that the Muftis and Qadis were also become sometimes custodians over um, for the resolution of inheritance or often even just for uh, uh, trade relations. I spent some time in opening this talk on the dynamics of Islamic law underpinning trade across the Sahara because this was also the language, uh, this was the language used of course to legitimate, justify and contest transactions uh, which makes it also the idiom through which the enslavement of people was legitimated, justified, and contested. The slave trade, historians have argued, preceded even the trade in gold across the Sahara uh, and endured and continued even increased after the establishment of the transatlantic slave trade in the 18th century, the early modern period. So now I'll move to actually discussing in kind of broad terms, um, the tremendous effects of slavery um, in shaping Saharan and Maghrebi or North African societies before then moving on to a couple of specific examples uh, from 19th century. Um, John Wright is a historian who's written, who's estimated that a total number 
of transits transporting enslaved people between 600 and 1499 approaches 4 million with an annual average of almost 4,000. Uh, other estimates note that between 800 and 1900 in the common era, uh, about 4 million people were forcibly driven across the Sahara. This from a broader view, if we uh, add in and incorporate 2 million coming um, by way of Ethiopia and the Southern Sudan to Egypt, 4 million enslaved people reaching the Middle East and India via, via the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean, the number of 10 in, million in aggregate of these victims almost approaches the 13 million Africans forced into ships um, through the, bound for the new world, world through the Middle Passage. Yet an important distinction here is that European slave trade occurred over a much shorter time, having a much more intensive impact on Africa. And by contrast, we'll note the sort of cumulative effect of this long, and we'll call it a slower trade uh, over many centuries. Um, just another thing to note was that the trans saharan slave trade historians believe was actually was also much uh, uh, more uh, dangerous for the for the enslaved people. Uh, death rates were much higher, uh, becoming more uh, higher mortality rates the further east to so Algeria and Libya compared to the coast. So now we'll talk a little bit about some of the institutions or um, kinds of justifications within uh, uh, an Islamic world uh, for, for slavery. Um, the first being sabi or capture, captivity, which has no uh, explicit relationship to race in that uh, any non-Muslim could be enslaved if conquered or vanquished. And indeed throughout the, the Maghreb and the Sahara throughout the period I'm discussing, enslaved people from the Balkans by way of the Ottoman Empire um, were forcibly brought to, uh, to Algeria and Morocco, as well as, of course, captives from European shipwrecks who were treated um, as enslaved people. And yet, uh, in practice, okay, and this gets back to the uh, intense caravan trade between the Sahara and the Sahel, it was the people of Bilad of Sudan, the Blacks, Black people who were most vulnerable to enslavement. And so this introduces, of course, the dynamic of race uh, to the practice of enslavement throughout the Sahara, the Sahel, and North Africa. A second important dynamic is one of manumission, whereby in following Prophet's hadith, which of course complements um, uh, the, the Quran, that whoever frees a Muslim slave, God will save all parts of his body from hell as he has free, freed the body parts of the slave. So um, in theory, this injunction to free someone as a moral good would seem to potentially curb the practice of enslavement. And yet, and here, here we start to get into the, pro, uh, the dynamic of, of labor across the Sahara and North Africa, with ongoing manumission, this itself became, or freeing of enslaved peoples, this itself became a kind of motor for the need or the new, the, for the enslavement of more people to serve as domestics and laborers for households in North Africa, oases in the Sahara, salt mines, and, and so on. These kinds of tensions uh, within Islamic norms and Islamic law uh, created ongoing debate most famously uh, by Ahmed Baba, um, a renowned a scholar of Islamic law from Timbuktu in the 16th century, who was in fact himself imprisoned and taken to Marrakesh forcibly following the Moroccan King Ahmed al-Mansur's invasion of the Songhai Empire, a major kind of turning point um, in, in Maghrebi and, 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 and Sahelian uh, relations. Um, while in Marrakesh, the Ahmed Baba responded to a fatwa posed to him by um, um, people residing in an oasis in uh, Timimun, who sought clarification about how to determine what was considered lawful enslavement. In other words, if there are enslaved peoples who claim to be Muslims, and if those um, uh, who are enslaving them cannot otherwise determine outside of what they say, where they are from and whether they are indeed Muslims. How are, to, how, how are they to determine 
if this is a, a lawful enslavement. Mm -hmm. And Baba, in his response, essentially in his fatwa, essentially argued that if that the burden of proof falls upon the or owners, if a slave's origins cannot be determined outside of what the enslaved person says, um, then the person should not be enslaved. And what this fatwa does is it provides a kind of fascinating look at the contentious questions around how um, the justification to enslave people uh, had been taking up large numbers of Muslims across West Africa and the Sahel um, and enslaving them throughout the Sahara and North Africa. And the influence of this fatwa can be seen in the fact that even into the 19th century, uh, it was being discussed and debated throughout uh, uh, Morocco, Moroccan society, uh, uh, and, 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 and also in, in um, West Africa and the Sokoto Caliphate. Now, Ahmed Baba was not the only one to be discussing this. Uh, there's historians who are also sort of condemning the widespread practice, which seemed to be um, enslaving people by color rather than by um, faith. Um, and given this massive and ongoing enslavement, it of course raises the question, what were they brought, uh, where were they taken and what were they brought to do? And essentially um, enslaved peoples throughout the Sahara were brought uh, to perform all kinds of labor um, to maintain irrigation, elaborate irrigation channels that were prone to um, uh, of course, just being filled with sand, digging and maintaining and tending wells, herding livestock, and tending gardens, cultivating dates, which are the principal activities of the uh, oasis agriculture. They were also uh, taken to work in salt mines, um, and these were places uh, where only enslaved people performed the labor. Um, Ahmed al Mansur is a famous example of conscripting um, people from the Sahel into an army and formed an entire armed force for, that served the Moroccan Mahzen or state. But the most common uh, sort of uh, place ended up being domestic work for urban households and cities and settlements across North Africa. And consequently, the largest number of enslaved people brought to North Africa were female rather than male. This uh, phenomenon was noted uh, as one Moroccan historian uh, has written by uh, two French brothers who were traveling in Morocco in the first two decades of the 20th century who uh, describe for pages the um, sort of um, the number of black servants serving wealthy houses in Fez. Uh, the Sahara, meanwhile, if we note just the degree to which it depended upon enslaved labor, it is not a stretch to say that the Saharan settled societies were in fact only made possible by this uh, enslaved labor. So now I'll move on, um, having sort of discussed uh, several of the driving forces and dynamics, um, legal institutions, formal organization of trans saharan trade across time, to look at a couple of examples specifically from the 19th century, which I understand is the focus of this seminar. Um, and it's uh, only been recently when actually scholars of the Sahara have paid more attention to the 19th century because the sort of older school I was describing really assumed that the trans saharan trade went into decline from the 15th century on um, when uh, the European conquest of the new world, right, uh, um, transformed world economies, as well as uh, the direct colonization of large parts of Africa, established new imperial systems of resource extraction that essentially bypassed this longstanding intermediary of trans saharan trade. In other words, historians for a long time assumed that by the 19th century, this, uh, this millennium long network had more or less collapsed. An additional uh, element ostensibly impacting trans Saharan trade in the 19th century was that major colonial powers in Africa, both Britain and France, legally prohibited, prohibited slavery. The UK in 1834, France in 1848. And as European rule became more entrenched um, as the century went on, one might logically assume that this colonial rule would bring an end to enslavement, further contributing to undermining trans Saharan trade. 
Recent histories that focus on sort of more regional dynamics of trans-Saharan trade show that this is not true. That 19th century global economic shifts had uneven effects across different parts of the Sahara uh, with different regions revealing significant continuities in sla enslavement and trade uh, under colonialism. Focusing on this uh, more local regional dynamics also reveal quite divergent experiences of colonial rule across different parts of the Sahara, which I'll turn to now. So in the rest of the talk, I'll focus specifically on, on two examples, and then I'll conclude with um, just a couple of references to the, that illustrate some of the continuities and legacies of what are sometimes termed post-slavery societies in different parts of the Sahara today. 19th century examples I'll focus on are the Algerian Sahara under French colonial rule, and then Mauritania, which was treated as a desert hinterland and consequently was far less affected by colonial rule until well into the 20th century. And in looking at Mauritania, I'll be focusing on what this example can tell us about a racial formation produced not so much by colonial intervention, but again, by centuries of trans foreign trade. So in Algeria, before France even legally abolished slavery, it undertook a prolonged violent and ultimately successful military campaign to occupy Algiers and establish uh, colonial rule, which was initially established really only over the, the, the Algerian coast. And while the French would go on to rule Algeria for a century, during the 30s and 40s, authorities faced uh, significant resistance uh, in Algeria, basically anywhere outside coastal cities such as Algiers and Oran. Nonetheless, the French had maintained harbored grand ambitions, even utopian ideas about a settler colony um, that could be made possible through modern forms of social engineering. This gave rise to multiple schemes whereby French colonial administrators, as well as their settler support, European supporters, proposed purchasing sub-Saharan enslaved peoples in order to essentially substitute for and replace what was called, and therefore resolve what was called the indigenous question at the time among French. In short, given the resistance of Algerians to French occupation, along with racist ideas about Muslim and Dijen and their potential what French deemed incompatibility for this utopian French uh, settler colony, these, uh, uh, these, these kind of dangerously utopian proposals sought to replace indigenous Algerians with purchased formerly enslaved peoples from Sub-Saharan Africa. This was an effort in otherwise to instrumentalize trans-Saharan trade for uh, French uh, colonial ends. <laughs> like many colonial plans relative to the Sahara, these population replacement schemes were never realized. Benjamin Brower, a historian who describes these schemes through his research in French colonial archives, notes instead that the French developed what Brouwer terms an eyes closed approach to slavery during the 19th century. Unable to effectively enforce any prohibition on enslavement, where particularly in the Sahara where colonial outposts were stretched thin and military rule depended upon uh, cooperation among local notables, the French instead practiced a form of accommodation or a de facto kind of toleration of slavery until 1906. This despite, of course, the French legal prohibition. So to illustrate this point, Brouwer draws from an 18, 1877 written account of a French explorer named Victor Largeau, who attended the slave market in Warkala, here spelled differently, highlighted on the map. Warkala, again, a kind of terminus in the trans saharan trade. Um, uh, Largeau was seeking someone to relieve his servant of cooking duties and it kept a kind of uh, account of his experience of the slave market there where Largeau writes, in the courtyard of an old house, a dozen young black girls clothed in blue cotton robes stood or crouched against their wall, the walls, their eyes lowered and full of tears. <clears throat> in the corner, a group of 15 children swarmed about, several of whom were not quite five years old. Squatting in the middle, a few Arabs chatted with the slave trader. So following a, a physical inspection, Largeau decided to purchase a 16 year old young woman paid a price through a broker since both according to local custom, which generally prevents Jew, prevented Jews and Christians from participating in the trade, 
not to mention the French legal prohibition, which was ostensibly then seven, several decades old. Largeau nonetheless completed the transaction through an intermediary. Um, and uh, once he met the young woman, he just asked her to say, tell him where she was from. And Seba responded, I am Fulani. She noted that she was a freeborn Muslim from a wealthy family who had been taken from her home in the middle Niger River region. Now the complexity of the capturing of uh, and enslaving of freeborn Muslims throughout the Sahel is itself uh, a subject of uh, intensive sort of scholarship and debate among scholars. Uh, throughout the 19th century, there were uh, a number of jihad movements and, and states uh, that produced a lot of turbulence throughout the Sahel region, but that actually also um, perhaps paradoxically uh, intensified the enslavement of, uh, of freeborn Muslims um, amongst and between uh, Sahelian societies. And here's one example of Sabah um, subsumed into the trans saharan trade. Saba also serves as an example documented by Brouwer of tr how trans saharan trade continued in Algeria throughout the 19th century. Though the scale of it was relatively small, both in relative to prior centuries and in relation to what was happening further west. For as Eastern routes of the trade uh, became lost favor due both to, as I mentioned, the higher mortality rates, as well as increased French presence in the Algerian Sahara, caravans across uh, Western Sahara increased up to as many as what's estimated 4,000 enslaved people a year brought to Morocco between 1840 and 1870. For the purpose, so I'll move now to uh, a second example of Mauritania or Western Sahara, um, sometimes known as Bilad al um, and which is also the setting for Khalid Assis's article, which I think was uh, perhaps part of the, the packet. I also hope the uh, chapter by Brower on Sabah can be added to the, to the materials available and I'll provide that if it's not already there. Um, so coastal routes uh, that were en uh, enslaved, uh, trafficking of enslaved peoples only intensified in the late 19th century, typically traversed Mauritania a largely desert region that, unlike Algeria, was not colonized until the end of the 19th century, and then really only nominally uh, until the 19th centuries, uh, until the 20th century, even the 1930s, when the desert hinterland was incorporated more fully into French West Africa. As such, the racial formation sketched out in Khalid de Seyss's article, which I'll talk a little bit more now, was produced by centuries of trans saharan trade, rather than the sort of direct intervention of colonialism or colonial modernity. Asesa focuses in his article on the exceptional example of Bilal Wuld Mahmoud, who gained his freedom through the spiritual authority he acquired by the miracle of giving voice to a camel. Asesa uses this example to focus on the expression of agency for a formerly enslaved person in the racially hierarchical society and Muslim culture of Saharan society, and notes how this agency was asserted specifically in spiritual, Islamic, and Sufi ways. Asisa describes how for all of Bilal's extraordinary, we could call it, say miraculous ascent from an animal herder enslaved person to a recognized Sufi state, saints still venerated today, this trajectory also brings into relief the racial hierarchies of Mauritanian and Saharan society providing also insight into the particular aspects and characteristics of this racial formation across Western Sahara. So it's already been noted that enslaved people transported from the Sahel were majority female, and that these enslaved women often became married to the men who purchased them. As was the case of Bilal's father marrying an enslaved woman named Vaitum, as Saisa describes, um, with whom together they had four children. So this um, entailment of enslavement that entails kinship is a major distinction of Saharan slavery from say the chattel slavery of the um, Atlantic slave trade. This kinship holds the possibility in, in turn to impart the high status to the male children of enslaved women if they are born to a father uh, in particular who traces 
a kind of a kinship or genealogy of um, claiming lineage uh, shurfa to the Prophet Muhammad. Or there are other you know, high status uh, genealogical claims that can be made. This kind of, this emphasis on genealogy means both there is a kind of fluidity to social ranks in Saharan society, but also there is a aspect of racialization to genealogy, genealogical claims itself. Um, in other words, genealogy is anthropologist's form of encompassment, right? Claiming um, uh, ancestry to uh, the Hijaz, to, um, uh, the, uh, to Prophet Muhammad, but also it erases even members of family who are deemed uh, not members of the lineage, and those were often um, enslaved or formerly enslaved mm -hmm. people. That is. So the scholar Bruce Hall notes that this local gloss given to certain Islamic ideas, the significant dis distinction between believer and unbeliever that underpinned uh, a sabi, as well as important notions of lineage and genealogy inform the particularly Saharan and Sahelian constructions of race. We also have importantly, the Hamidic myth with a popular be belief extracted from of course the Quran that blackness that Noah's curse upon the son of Ham was uh, that, 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 that blackness was in fact a, a sign derived from that. And many scholars of race in the Sahara have noted the, the, the enduring popularity of this Hamidic myth when it is un-Islamic and really had no basis in Islamic law, yet it was remarkably um, enduring. Now, Bilal moved from one status to another, from um, a shepherd to a Sufi saint, uh, of course, as well from an enslaved person to a formerly enslaved person, which in uh, across North Africa, um, Sahara are known as, uh, is a social class referred to as Hartani or in plural Haratin. Um, Bilal also named after Bilal bin Arabah, who of course was one of, named after one of the most celebrated historical figures in Muslim history, an enslaved man originally from Abyssinia, um, whose embrace of Islam and rise to become the first muazzin or caller to prayer in the newly Muslim community of Medina, uh, has also rendered him a, a symbol to African descended peoples. And the naming of Bilal uh, Mahmoud uh, after this figure also shows the kind of um, Islamic culture as, uh, as the, the form, the idiom uh, for of, uh, contesting and also expressing agency within a racially hierarchical society. So in being freed, of course, Bilal was one of the Hartani. Um, a term uh, of rich kind of significance and, and one much debated that both means dark color in Tamazight, one of the Amazight languages, but also with a close resemblance to two Arabic words, har from free and thani, the second, sec meaning which is taken to be mean that the word somehow is derived from Arabic to mean a free person of second class. And indeed in Mauritania, which is a, a a racially hierarchical society of both Arabic and non-Arabic speaking peoples. Uh, the Haratin are both racially defined as black, even as they are in a sense, linguistically and culturally assimilated into the Arabic speaking uh, population. The elites of which are actually referred to themselves as Bidan, which of course is, is a racialized term in Arabic meaning the whites. So Haratin are both uh, members of Arabic speaking society and this broader majority, yet one with an inferior social status that is racialized. Um, what I'll talk about, what I can talk about more also perhaps in Q and A is that over time during the post-colonial period, um, specifically from the 1980s on, the Haratin have actually become a self-identified political movement um, that, I, that uh, both embrace and identify with this kind of hybrid culture, Arabophone, but also racialized uh, as different um, to claim rights in post-colonial Mauritanian society. Mauritania is particularly sort of distinctive in this regard as well in that um, 
it is a reflection of this kind of threshold between Sahara and the Sahel, uh, an Arabophone uh, majority, um, as well as um, several non-Arabophone populations, Soninke, Pular, Wolof, um, who are uh, Black non-Arabic uh, um, uh, ethnic groups. Yet within, as I just mentioned, Arabophone uh, Mauritanian society, there is this uh, racial higher uh, stratification between the Bailon um, and the Haratin. This complexity and the different idioms for describing uh, uh, race across the Sahara um, have drawn more and more attention among scholars, um, historians and anthropologists alike. Um, this is particularly true in Mauritania, as I mentioned, uh, where Al Hur uh, is a political movement that has come to represent, stand for, and claim the rights of the Haratin as a self identified um, constituency and segment of Mauritanian uh, society. They were essentially voiceless up until the 1980s. Another interesting example is uh, a, a novel by Ahmed Wild Abdul Qadr named Al Asma Al Mutarayyar. Um, Abdul Qadr is, uh, writes this novel, which is, is, is a kind of Bildungsroman of late colonial uh, Mauritania, anti-colonial resistance and uh, decolonization. And at the center of the novel, which uh, begins with a caravan in the Sahel and the object, abduct, uh, you know, capture of a young boy, um, this uh, character becomes a central figure in the novel um, who both, uh, you know, escapes from uh, and is recaptured multiple times over his name changing several times. Um, he falls in love, he's even imprisoned by the French, uh, and his travails, in a sense, intersect with late colonial and, uh, and anti colonial and then post colonial developments of, of Mauritania itself. Excuse me, Professor George. Yes. Um, we have now got 10 minutes left, and um, I wanted to ask quickly, is this translated into English? Not to my knowledge, though it deserves to be. Um, yeah. even, it's practice. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I, even um, copies are not particularly widespread in, in Mauritania, although Ahmed Abdul Qadr is very well known. He became a kind of um, poet uh, uh, laureate of a leftist movement in the late 60s and early 70s known as the Kadahin, um, a sort of toilers movement that, uh, anyhow, that's a whole other story. Um, <laughs> and so he's a well-known figure uh, and he, he, he composed a lot of poetry uh, around the, 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 that political movement at the time. And then later wrote this, this and other novels. Um, yeah, thank you, Susan. I also just, uh, my last point, and I actually, I think, can end the sharing is that, um, oh, to thank you, uh, <laughs> um, to note uh, a, a number of um, uh, sources that I, I, I've referenced throughout this talk, including one I didn't mention by name, but uh, this, uh, my arrow is over a, a New Yorker interview with Biramul Abid, who is one of the leaders of Al Hor, this, this political movement in Mauritania. Um, one of the more prominent and controversial ones. But the last thing I just wanna say, and then hopefully there's time for some questions, is um, another sign of the kind of enduring significance and legacy of the, the slavery is both in the societies themselves, Mauritania, Sahara, Morocco, but also in um, academia. In the summer of 2020, when everyone was uh, you know, stuck at home, their academics did something they do best, which is they started an argument with each other over a list <laughs> serve um, regarding essentially the legacies of, of, of slavery and race in, in the Sahara. And it was a fascinating discussion across a list serve um, that, uh, you know, I can't share spe you know, specific extracts, but it went on for weeks and was really substantive, where many scholars felt that the, the question of um, slavery, uh, enduring racism, uh, and in a sense, the role of Islam in justifying these hierarchies had been elided or downplayed for too long. Perhaps, you know, the kind of centrality of 
post-colonial studies in a, in a September 11th world to, to, to sort of speak back against Islamophobia and they have been contributed to this. Um, and so there was a kind of ongoing back and forth among scholars around even, you know, not only calling for greater um, debate and attention uh, to race and racism, um, specifically in the Sahara and West Africa, um, under and the whole sort of thread was under the, the title anti-blackness and in the Arab world and the violence that doesn't get a hashtag. And of course, this is all following the, the and precipitated by the murder of George Floyd mm. and the social movements around that. So it was interesting to follow within the debate. There were also discussions around, you know, some were calling for to name this uh, racism, Arab Islamic racism. Um, others were pointing out the problem, uh, you know, the, the, the problem with that term. Uh, they would be call it you know, Christian racism or, or, or ascribe another religion to this. But it was interesting to note the, where some of the positionality uh, of, and the commitments of different scholars taking different terms. Others were saying, well, we should call this, you know, trans racist, race and, and slavery, um, as we call it, sort of Indian Ocean slavery and, and so on. So I just want to sort of end on this note that it's an ongoing debate. Uh, that sort of resonates with also a burgeoning scholarship by uh, among scholars who are engaging with concepts like um, racial capitalism and applying this to uh, uh, historical developments uh, across North Africa and the Sahara and to say it's, it's an ongoing and open topic of conversation. Okay, thank you.